Hello and welcome to IDEA to IPO. I'm Jennifer Stowell and IDEA to IPO has been hosting tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have have over 100,000 members among all of our meetup gr groups all across the globe. We have organized, promoted, and produced over 2,569 events. By any standard, by any measure, we are the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days we are 100% online. We hold an event startup every day of the week. Check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. At this point, I'm going to hand it off to our distinguished moderator, Jason Putnam-Gordon. Jason, take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been working with Idea to IPO since uh, 2013. Used to do events in person. These days we're virtual, as Jennifer said. We've got a great panel for you today. Today, we're going to be focused on innovation and investment in health tech. Fantastic panel with Mary Grove from Bread and Butter Ventures, Gary Goldman from the Global Health Impact Fund, and Ephraim Lindenbaum from Advanced Ventures. Before I turn it over to them and have them introduce themselves, I'd like to spend a little bit of time tell you about how we're going to proceed today. So today, the panel is going to speak for about, uh, or the panel is going to have a discussion for about an hour. After that, we'll do uh, about 25 minutes or so of Q&A. If you've got questions, fantastic. Please submit them in the Q&A function. It's not only am I gonna be moderating today, but I'm gonna be running the tech in the background. It's easier for me to handle. We'll try and monitor the chat, but it'll be easier for us to try and get to your questions if you use the Q&A function. Uh, additionally, today's event is recorded. So on the upside, if you miss some or all of it, so long as you, so long as you have registered, I'll be able to follow up and send it to you afterwards. Downside is it's going to be recorded for posterity. So please don't share any confidential information with us uh, because not only may the people uh, in the room today see it, but folks who, who view this recording afterwards may see it as well. So I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney. I work with health tech startups. We're talking about diagnostics, devices, digital health, both on the consumer and then also on the clinical side of things. Uh, we'll start with our first time that we've had this panelist, Mary Grove. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, the best contact information for you, uh, and what your particular area of interest or focus is within health tech, it'd be much appreciated. Terrific, Jason. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's terrific to be here with people from all over the world who are chiming in here on the chat. So I'm Mary Grove. I'm managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures. We are an early stage venture capital firm based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I'm coming to you from today. And we invest nationally. We invest nationally in the sectors that we believe are the bread and butter or the backbone sectors, if you will, of the modern economy moving forward. And those in particular are food technology, health technology, and enterprise SaaS. And so our whole fund thesis is we invest in companies globally, but then leverage the Minnesota home field advantage in our backyard, primarily the corporate backbone of industry that are based here to support our companies um, at scale. So currently we have 41 companies in our portfolio spread pretty well uh, around, across the country. We can invest uh, internationally as well, though primarily focus on the US and we focus on seed stage, so really early stage, you know, live working MVP in market. And uh, within the firm, I lead our health tech practice. And so we particularly focus on digital, the software side of health tech. Happy to talk about uh, some of the recent investments we've made and just the incredible amount of innovation we've seen in particular, you know, in the last 12 months and this difficult time in, in the world has been really accelerating investments in, for our firm. And then my, my personal background prior to bread and butter, I was an investment partner at Revolution on the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. Before that, I spent 15 years at Google where I worked on the IPO deal team when the company went public. I did early stage product biz dev for about six years. And then I built the Google for Startups organization for the company, which we scaled our efforts to about 130 countries. And so my passion is 
really about uh, democratizing access to capital, supporting a diverse group of, of founders, and really interested in what's happening outside of Silicon Valley. Wonderful. We're delighted to have you here today. We're also so glad to be breaking out of the Silicon Valley bubble. Uh, maybe we'll move over to Gary next. Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your area of focus, and uh, best way to get contacted if, uh, if you want to be contacted. Oh, crap, and I just muted you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. Thanks. Uh, I guess it's well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to meet everyone. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about myself. I'm Gary Goldman. Um, I've got about 30 plus years of experience as a healthcare provider. I'm a physician, I'm a dentist, I'm an informaticist. I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I've had three digital healthcare companies over the last 25 years. Um, and now uh, I'm currently the founder and CEO of Global Health Impact Network and Global Health Impact Fund. And what we are is a clinician funded, founded and managed venture capital fund focused on digital health. And we also are a global clinician driven um, innovation network, uh, which consists of everything uh, that would be part of the ecosystem of taking uh, idea generation all the way through commercialization. Um, you know, the, 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 the premise in which we created our fund and our network was totally clinician driven. Um, I spent quite a bit of time traveling around the country as a consultant, as an in informaticist, and it was really, um, it, was, it, it, it was hard to listen to all my colleagues who were all disenchanted, unhappy with electronic healthcare records, feeling like they had loss of control as to where healthcare was going. And more importantly, we all realized that if Judy Faulkner and, and Epic had had three of us in her garage when she was building her solution, we'd have a very different healthcare world right now. So um, we built this network and fund with the idea of promoting the access and opportunity for clinicians to play an active role in this evolving digital healthcare revolution that's in front of us. We had the tech bubble when I first moved here. Now we've got the healthcare bubble um, and we have an opportunity, but it, we're making it very clear that clinicians have to take a very active role in the process as advisors, investors, consultants, as well as the opportunity to be innovators and entrepreneurs. So we support all of that. Um, and we are very agnostic. You know, we're looking to um, partner with virtually anyone that could add to the ecosystem of making that group of people successful. Um, and I've participated in num these numerous events uh, with this group and have been continued to be very impressed with the uh, programs that are put on and in how it promotes digital health. So I'm happy to be here. Um, you can reach me and the Global Health Impact Fund and Network at Gary at globalhealthimpactnetwork.net and I will post it in the chat. We're delighted to have you back, Gary. Thank you very much. Um, and if I am, it's great to have you back as well. Tell us a little bit about yourself, area of focus and whether you wanna be contacted and how to do that. Loaded sure, question. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, first, uh, let me thank my esteemed colleagues and our host, Rob. Uh, I think like you, Jason, I've been doing this for so many years, I've forgotten, uh, probably 2015 on. It's great to see both you and Gary. We've all done panels before, both on this network and others. And welcome, Mary. It's great to get your perspective as both a Valley person and now an ex-Valley person. All, all great to hear about. So a little about my background. I'm a Brian Lindenbaum from Advanced Ventures, and I'm a recovering entrepreneur. I started uh, my backstory as a, a founder here in Silicon Valley, uh, launched and grew a very large company, seven countries. 350 uh, employees here through the 90s in Silicon Valley, got ready to exit in the first dot-com boom. And, uh, you know, a big M&A offer came in. So I was the dumbest guy you ever met for not going public in the dot-com boom. And a few years later, smartest guy you ever met. In turn, uh, it's somewhat binary here in Silicon Valley. If you're an entrepreneur that exits, you either start your next company or you become an investor. I jokingly say I didn't have any great ideas, but really what I had is some great partners. And we spun up uh, Advanced Ventures in 1999. We're one of the few remaining remaining 1999 vintage fund in the world, which either means we're gluttons for punishment or pretty good at what we do. We've invested through three successive funds now and currently investing out of the tail end of our third and managed co-fund. 
In terms of digital health, you know, our firm invests across a category of technology, health, and wellness. And as you can imagine, over 20 years, that's evolved. But we became really involved in the digital health category in the late 2000s. As you saw, the real convergence between technology, uh, hardware, and mobility. And that was really very much of our sweet spot. We've been historic food and ag investors. In fact, we're one of the first true ag tech investors in the world and have been through CPG as well. So when we saw this convergence, we really jumped in and, and we're able to leverage a lot of our expertise in the broader sense as it applies to digital health. And, uh, you know, it's been a great ride. As, as Gary said, we're in a bit of a bubble, but, you know, it's a very precarious bubble right now. Uh, you know, we were really blessed as a fund. We've had an exit about every 14 months since being founded. And, uh, you know, as it applies to digital health, we've had two exits in the last uh, 14 months as well. Uh, you know, in the digital health category, one right before COVID, where we left a tremendous amount of money on the table, and uh, one during COVID, where we probably gained it all back. So we're excited to talk about it. It's a very interesting time in digital health, and look forward to the panelists. Fantastic. As I said, we've got a star-studded panel today. Uh, with that in mind, I've closed the poll and I'm going to give you the results real quick, and then we're going to pivot into the conversation and talk about what's happened over the last sort of 12 months or so since that's when we found ourselves in COVID as a prelude to talking about you know, what we see moving down the pipe. So in the room, we've got about 30% of the folks are first time entrepreneurs followed by about 20% serial entrepreneurs, which is great to see. Uh, we've got a few angel investors, a few VCs, some folks in academia, we've got, got some attorneys, hello, fellow attorneys out there, uh, and where we're located. So we've got th almost 30% in the Bay Area and then 43% outside uh, somewhere else in the US. 10% uh, in North America, 10% in Europe, and then uh, a few in Asia, Africa. But don't forget, if you registered, we'll be able to send you the recording. So there'll be folks who, are, who, are, who, are, who will watch it uh, non-contemporaneously. And then the spaces, uh, we've got 13% in therapeutics, 21% in diagnostic, or excuse me, devices, 13 in diagnostics, 33 in telehealth, super hot area right now, clinical trial tech, operations care and management, and then another bucket of other. So with that in mind, maybe we'll repeat the circle that we just did. And uh, Mary, if you could share with us a little bit uh, of what you've seen uh, in health tech over the last 12 months, as sort of a prelude to what you see coming down the pike. And we'll open up for Gary and, and have to jump in as, as everyone sort of sees fit. And I'll try and stay out of the way because no one booked this to see me. Not at all, Jason, nor have you the better. Um, so it's been an exciting time for, for us investing in the health tech space. We've made four investments over the past nine months in this sector. And you know the themes that we're really immersed in right now are the trends around value-based care more broadly. We're looking deeply at, at social determinants of health. We've been looking to invest specifically on the digital side in solutions that target very segmented but very large segments of the population. So the four investments that we've done, for example, uh, one is called River Health, now based in, in Minneapolis, and they've built a low-cost accessible healthcare plan that's targeted millennials to start. So $35 a month accessible price point to cover the four you know, most frequently used services, including primary care, uh, sexual health, female health, and mental health. And we've seen them really uh, take off over the past year. Again, the notion of, of telehealth, which you alluded to earlier. So that's been one, one big category. Our, another investment we've made, is that we're looking closely at the elder care, uh, se senior care space in general. We've made a, an investment there um, that hasn't yet been announced, but it's in a company that we're really excited about who's transforming, we think, the way you think about long -term, the long-term care market by bringing to market a new elder care insurance product you know, from the ground up from scratch. So the intersection too of health tech and FinTech has been a big theme in the last year that we've, that we've seen. And then female health is the other big category, very broad category, of course, within that many layers to unpack. But the first two investments we've made that we're really excited about, um, one is called, in a company called Cherry Blossom Intimates out of Washington, DC. And they do 3D customizable, fully insurance reimbursable prosthetics for breast cancer patients, along with a line of intimate apparel to support it and think about bringing a, a beautiful, elegant boutique e-commerce experience and e-commerce experience to this, to this sector uh, is really transformative, we think. And then our last investment we just made, we just announced last week, 
um, and I'm happy to put the post in the chat here, but it's in a, a maternal telehealth platform called Nest Collaborative, which, you know, we think that telehealth in general has leapfrogged a decade in the last year, but that trend is here to stay, right? Telehealth isn't new, but the, the surge in, in adoption we think is just is a permanent one. And so this is a company that's targeting maternal health with lactation support as the first vertical, but tremendous opportunity to both grow in that market and then expand a phenomenal team of, of founders. And so those are some of the big themes, Jason, that, that are top of mind for us as we look ahead to the coming year here. Uh, do you want us to just jump in, Jason? You're, you're muted. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, do you want to just jump in? That's fine. Sorry, technical issue Happy here. To. Yeah. No problem. Um, so Gary Goldman. Uh, yeah, so Mary, that's great. I, I really enjoyed listening to that. You know, we as a network and, and, and venture fund of clinicians have taken a pretty specific focus on digital health. Uh, I like to joke a little bit that, um, you know, I spent my whole life taking care of patients and somebody upstairs must have been watching me because when the crazy doctor started a venture fund on digital health, I think somebody upstairs looked down and said, you know what, uh, let's help digital health a little bit and let's give them a pandemic to kind of like facilitate things, um, which is of course not really funny, but um, the reality is, is that, you know, we've spent the last three years on, on from our perspective, putting together a network of clinicians that could go out and add a level of due diligence to the process that wasn't typically done. I mean, avoiding like the Theranos kind of investments, you know, again, had um, Elizabeth Holmes had three pathologists on her, on her team, that would have been a dead company very early on. So um, with that said, um, we targeted our investment, invest, investments and our the due diligence with targeted investors. So we would go out if it was an orthopedic solution or if it was in the maternal fetal medicine space and we would identify OBGYNs or orthopedic surgeons. And we would spend probably as much time clinically doing due diligence evaluation um, as we would the typical uh, venture capital uh, due diligence. And you know, with a focus on identifying, you know, we, we picked digital health because we felt, I felt, that we were, from my perspective as an informaticist, as a serial entrepreneur, really at the precipice of a revolution in, in healthcare and then how, um, with or without us, it was moving forward. And then of course, you know, the pandemic happens and that really forces especially telemedicine and remote patient monitoring into a place where no one would have ever anticipated because most of those businesses were, I will say, tagging along slowly with, 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 with some progress, but not a huge amount. Um, so I feel kind of lucky that we were in that space, um, but the approach that we use is like, if you look at maternal, you know, the maternal fetal medicine or uh, obstetrics space, um, our focus is, is we went out and looked at how do we monitor babies during labor and be, before labor during pregnancy. And the typical technology would be using fetal heart rate. Right now, that's been used for you know 50 years, um, but it's it's reliably unreliable and not very predictive, and it results in unnecessary cesarean sections, and um, it also results in a, a delay in the diagnosis and treatment of a fetal a problem with a fetus during labor. We went out and found a technology which now allows us to uh, non invasively monitor transabdominally fetal oxygenation. Pretty much everyone knows what a pulse oximeter is and monitors your oxygenation and ability to, to, to oxygenate, oxygenate your body and how effective your lungs are and, and, and the way, how effective your system is from a, you know, a patient perspective. Um, so we can do that with a baby now, which is directly correlated with fetal outcome and fetal well-being, um, which is a game changer. And we were able to identify that very, very early on because we brought on to the table a group of anesthesi obstetric anesthesiologists and a group of maternal fetal medicine doctors and OBGYNs. So we really focus on identifying those game-changing technologies, whether it's remote patient monitoring or whether it's a, 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 an efficiency platform. We're looking at taking telemedicine into a specialty specific 
model as opposed to what it exists now, which is this. I laugh a little bit. Now that the pandemic started, I walk in our bedroom and I watch my wife sit in front of three computers, which is so inefficient because she has Zoom on one computer uh, and she has Epic or the electronic healthcare record on another and needs another computer, which she's not allowed to use for anything else to look up things. So that's the efficiency of technology that we have in the new world, which is kind of the way electronic healthcare records started. They added a huge level of inefficiency to our workflow as clinicians. So the idea of being able to identify those solutions that really affect a provider's ability to collaborate with a patient. Because at the end of the day, all this other stuff is great and revenue cycle is great and, and how acute care works. But at the end of the day, if we can't maximize the interaction between a patient and a provider in a way that takes care from episodic disease care to complete care, um, we failed as a healthcare system. So that really is the approach that we take and we look to partner um, with other venture capitalists and with, you know, with other parts of the ecosystem, because as clinicians, we're agnostic. We just want to help healthcare. So that's the approach that we're taking. And I think that's really the way for the future of, of healthcare technology to succeed. Super. F, F what have yeah, you seen? Think, yeah. Yeah, no, certainly, certainly. Well, you know, just to pivot, great feedback from all the colleagues here. I mean, I think you know, now is a really interesting time in digital health. I think one of the things that, that is, you know, front and center is this COVID epidemic. It has ex it really exposed significant opportunities throughout the value chain on one hand. On the other hand, it's completely jammed up the entire digital health and pharmaceutical space. You know, being a little later stage and maybe understanding from being in the space a lot of years, you know, to what Gary and my colleague Mary are saying, you know, this has not been a great year for most of digital health, and it's certainly been a terrible year for therapeutics beyond COVID. Um, you know, telehealth has been really one of the few, if only bright spots at this stage. I mean, let's be point blank. Now, the category itself has seen trem tremendous investment. Let me give you guys a little bit of data. Coming off the Rock Health, which I think we believe is one of the best data reports, and you know this is very helpful for the entrepreneurs out there. Other than talking about deals we've done, but really talk about the overall market. So number one, you know, uh, 2020 was one of the biggest years in digital health investment, right? 72% increase over 2018. 440 deals done last year, 14.1 billion in, in dollars invested. On top of that, we've also seen tremendous IPO, $37 billion worth of public market value creation in, 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 the, in the sector with health IPOs and 145 deals on the M&A side in the space. So it is ripe, it is hot. However, that being said, there are very unique categories that, are, that make sense, um, you know, and you've got to be really thoughtful as an entrepreneur about this issue, because I would have told you at the end of last year, and I think we did a few of these panels, that digital health was kind of dead, frankly. I mean, we were very, very disappointed in digital health. We thought it was, you know, a lagging category. We had really pulled up a lot of stakes. We put a lot of dollars in the category, and it was a very challenging market. It was very slow adoption curve. Uh, revenues were a fraction of what anybody predicted, and it was really a down cycle, to be frank with you. Uh, then, then the epidemic hit, and we started to see traction in some areas. You know, telehealth being one of them. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we we actually sold the telehealth company in the middle of all this. I think that's the right side of the story to be on right now. Um, you know, in particular, you know, there has been this move in things like telehealth to find any sublevel flavors. You know, I think the jury's still out post COVID how much of traction there is, but there's a lot of inequality that needs to get solved. You know, many other categories of the broader digital health space, diagnostic, etc. If it's not directly COVID related, has been decimated. I mean, we have seen FDA cycles on therapeutics push out two or three years based on this. I mean, if you're a company trying to get products through 510 or FDA, which most companies in this category have to actually do to go out and be commercial, you have seen a one to two year slowdown in your cycle, which means these companies are on the rocks. There is a tremendous problem with capital there. These companies are going bankrupt. It is very, very difficult. So I'm not trying to be a downer. I just want to put it out there because there is this belief that, geez, everything's great. All this money's coming in. 
but it's top. Now, let me talk about some of our excitement. You know, for us, we have a company that was in diagnostic testing predominantly in food and agriculture, one of our key areas of investment, right? Now, they had a great team. They actually came out of human diagnostic and were able to pivot. You know, they thought it was in the board. We all felt it was our obligation to try and make a difference during a pandemic. And very quickly, they spun up. And within six weeks, they had high speed, high regulatory COVID testing. And they went for their EUA. Something kind of interesting happened on the way to the circus, so to speak, there. The FDA said, we're spinning up something called Operation Warp Speed with our Radix program. This is for folks that can really move a needle beyond putting out a standard qPCR PCR rapid test, which may or may not be accurate. We're going to give you a bunch of money to go into that program. They funded them to the tune of a couple million dollars last year and have rapidly helped them scale up. They, they were, even before a, a, you know, a true EUA was issued, they were, they were uh, vectored in to help the indigenous nations, the Navajo, Choctaw, Cherokee, that were being decimated at the end of last year with COVID. And they put million, you know, hundreds of thousands of tests on point for them to make a difference in Q4 last year. In turn, they were just accepted it into warp speed package two. So they are one of the few companies that can actually identify in a low cost, high speed way, COVID variants. And the perspective that we're hearing for NIH, CDC and the global side is that COVID is not going away anytime soon. You know, it may not be a top of mind issue, but surveillance testing, this will come up even more meaningfully than the flu every year for the foreseeable future. The testing for evolving variants is going to be very, very critical going forward. This particular company, as I mentioned, just moved into warp speed package two, uh, one of eight of 1400 companies chosen in this, you know, if I get my numbers a little off there into that program. They have been funded this, these dollars for, from the government to go out and get a high-speed, rapid variant detection, what they call a clade variant, out into the public health category by mid-year. In turn, the, the, the CE, the EU side of that is, has started operations. So, you know, I think you really have to dig deep, both in terms of what's a real business opportunity right now and where the exposure of, of challenges in the space occurred, but also how can you look deep and pivot some of your companies and some of your ideas in the category to be a point on solution that solves a big problem today? Because right now, the healthcare industry Industry has been decimated, like I said. On top of that, one would think all this money is flowing into healthcare, but Gary can speak to this. You know, we have seen hospitals lay off 30 to 50 percent of their clinicians over the last 12 months. I mean, it is decimated. Their ability to onboard any new products or services may be set back one to four years, and that's what we're hearing in the space. I'd love to hear if Mary's heard anything else from the Midwest there. I think that's a you know really terrific synopsis, and thank you for the data at the top, which is always a, a terrific frame to have. One alternative viewpoint that I'll provide on the venture side specifically is I think you know you have your firms nationally who excel specifically at health healthcare investing and really focus on that. But my observation is that in the past twelve months, you've seen a lot more generalist firms have an interest in the healthcare sector where they previously may have not deployed capital into that sector before. And so I do think that there is a, a uh, I don't know if I would call it a fear of missing out per se, but an increased attention, right, of not just certainly on the digital and the telehealth trend on the remote patient monitoring, a lot of these themes that are, we needed these solutions yesterday. Yes, those are opportunities, but I do think that there, there are a lot of emerging startups who are pitching more generalist firms right now with, with, a higher degree of success than they might have otherwise. And so I do think there is an open-mindedness about investing in the sector more broadly from a set of investors who haven't, who haven't done so to date. So I think that's, that's promising and it's, um, you know, it's exciting, but I do, I definitely think that the shifts that we're seeing, you know, it's going to take years to, to fully rebound in, in many specific cases. So, so could we maybe unpack concretely some of the challenges that you all are seeing and just to pick up on what F was saying, so, and you as well, Mary. So, you know, we're talking about that may, maybe access to capital, especially earlier stage was disrupted, uh, at least initially in COVID. Maybe that's changing now because there are more generalists getting in. Uh, and so maybe there's kind of more, more demand. 
Um, FDA cycles have been disrupted. Um, additionally, hospital systems and other providers uh, are under tremendous stress and strain. Um, and then another thing too that I've sort of observed is, or, or read about, which kind of also creates an opportunity is, you know, a lot of folks have missed their doctor's appointments for the last year, some or all of them. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts and opinions uh, on any of this. Uh, open, open question. I mean, what I'll say is, you know, again, coming it from the cl clinical perspective, um, you know, I mean, pandemics like this, they create problems and they create opportunities. Um, and I think what we've tried to do as a venture fund and network is to focus in on those opportunities from, again, a clinical perspective. And as you point out, um, we are now in a situation, I mean, when we first started this pandemic, I'm on the uh, local medical association council, and there was a huge flux last April of thousands of doctors whose practices would have gone under if they didn't do telemedicine, right? Patients couldn't come to see them. And I would tell you that, again, you know, in the local Contra Costa area, 80% of the doctors had no clue how to do telemedicine, okay? And um, we were partnered from other, some of my other businesses, I was partnered with a lot of these telemedicine companies, which as, you know, F and Mary have talked about, were just tagging along, right? They were, uh, it's an interesting concept of why should I do this to, oh my God, you know, you go from, I could do this to, oh, I have to do this, right? Um, 10,000 new providers in a week, <laughs> you know, I mean, almost unmanageable. So for us, we, we were lucky on our fund side to not have to really pivot for much of that because that's where we happen to have been focusing. Um, but we found the complete opposite. We've, we've not seen slowdown. We've seen an incredible growth in many of the companies that we've looked at. And we, if we pivoted anything from an investment perspective is to pivot to focus only on those companies that were taking advantage of the epidemic in a positive way, right? knowing that long-term that it would be a much longer play in terms of the, its, its adoption, because it's quite obvious to the clinicians that moving forward now, we are moving from some telemedicine and mostly face-to-face -to, -face to what I refer to as clicks and mortar environment, okay? Where it's a combination of the two, but most people look at that and they see telemedicine and they see face-to-face -face but there's this huge gray zone of hybrid that creates opportunity where there's deployment of extenders to the point of care with remote patient monitoring. There's chronic disease management. There are ways to monitor the little surgery that's going on, getting the patients out of the hospital earlier, leveraging these solutions, and then monitoring them at the point of care, senior living, assisted living, I mean, there are just so many opportunities that are out there. I would take the approach to almost argue that there are plenty of great opportunities, but the key is being able to identify the ones that are going to work. And really the clinicians are the ones that, and the patients can identify that fairly quickly. So um, that, that's my approach to, the, to this COVID environment. I think that's a great point. I mean, being able to identify, you know, they're, they're both early stage opportunities that there's no expectation of exit for five to seven years. And, it, you know, and that totally makes sense. Uh, you know, and then there are, there are opportunities that, that may be able to gain traction earlier. I think what we've seen is a lot of white space in the market, a lot of opportunity out there to find the right deals that can make a difference now. I, I think there's also a bit of a sobering effect to help people understand the time cycles, right? I mean, having been investing, you know, as long as we have in the category, I think it's, you know, for us, it's, it's great to see, you know, digital health, uh, you know, with, with telehealth, for example, taking off, you know, some things in IOT are making a big difference. We love senior care in categories like that. So I, there are a lot of great opportunities. I think what, what has happened is, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs have, have really started to pivot. And that's just like what I was talking about, about one of our companies. I mean, you know, it's not just looking at, you know, how do we approach this in the, it, with the mindset that maybe started before, you know, COVID, 
how do we approach this from a unique standpoint, number one. The second piece is we're seeing a lot of deal flow that, you know, frankly, is just too late for this epidemic, right? You know, another test kit company, that's not a venture deal. You know, there's lots of other capital out there that could, you know, really invest in that. You know, if it's super innovative, if it's a breath-based DNA story, if it's something super unique, then it totally makes sense. But, you know, we've seen people come to us with, uh, you know, another QPCR or PCR test, another mouth rinse. You know, those are things that, you know, I think have really sort of spent out in the market itself. And then, you know, what I think the entrepreneurs are having a hard time getting their arms around is who's the payer? You know, what we're seeing so much of today are entrepreneurs that come in, they pitch us a story, and they don't understand the ground rules of the game. And, you know, I'm not trying to be the downer VC of the day here, but what I am trying to do is, is you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs on this call today, 122. It looked like many of you are entrepreneurs. You know, what do you need to be up to speed on to come talk to us, right? You know, you need to understand the FDA and all of its variants. You know, what type, if any, approval do you need, right? You need to be able to talk about insurance reimbursement. If you don't know what a CMS code is, if you don't know who your payer is and how they pay and have a mechanism for doing so baked in your product, I can't tell you how many telehealth deals we have here. They roll in. We're going to do this for mental health. Well, how are you going to get paid? Oh, we're going to get insurance money. Well, where's your CMS code? What's that? Okay. They just lost, you know, they'll never get another meeting. So whereas, you know, the telehealth platforms that we, you know, were involved in that had five years under their belt, they were integrated with insurance. They, they had doctor waiting rooms. They had assignments. You know, they, you know, worked with folks like Gary over the years to get it into the cycle. So they, you know, so, you know, like I like to say, we, we like to be pointed into the wind in one of these. So in our mind, you know, great companies get bought or sold or go public in this opportunity. And we then look for the fertile fields to get into over the next cycle. So when we get these entrepreneurs, I think as you know, you need to think entrepreneur, you know, how is this relevant? Do you have all the right pieces of your story when you come to us? Because, you know, to Mary's point, yeah, there are, there's a lot of money out there. Uh, what I will tell you is, you know, if you want your company, need to survive more than 18 or 24 months, you know, taking, you know, money from a VC that doesn't have skills in this category, an investor that doesn't have skills, uh, you know, patience becomes a problem, right? If you haven't hit those milestones, if you're not where you hope to be in 18 months when you run out of money, there isn't money out there because you will run into at that point, the, the bloom will be off the rose to a degree that the money that's rushed into the category will have dried up and you'll be left with people like the three of us who've been doing this for a long time. We're going to ask you hard questions. And if you don't have answers, you will have lost the opportunity to bring your idea forward. So my thought is, you know, and what I encourage all investors to, you know, the entrepreneurs to do is, understand what we're looking for. You know, make sure you understand your market. It's not just building Zoom for telehealth. It's not just like, hey, I've got this great, you know, IoT device for, for seniors out there. It's all about who's going to pay for it. What's your adoption cycle? Who do you sell it to? And then looking through that cycle and saying, where do I have to interface with the, with, you know, the regulatory authorities? You know, I hear so many people come to me at entrepreneurs and say, Oh yeah, this is a IOT device. I never have to talk to anybody on the regulatory side. And then they tell me they interface with Epic, which is a medical record. And all of a sudden that blew up. And I see Gary, you know, you can give a lecture on this, but all of a sudden they really do have to interface with regulatory authorities. And the minute that data hit Epic and the minute the telehealth guys have to report back to a clinician, all of a sudden you're back into a regulated product and they had no idea what they were doing. So what I really push forward to the entrepreneurs, understand your market, figure it out. If you come to us and say, we're getting through the FDA for, you know, five, 10 for less than two to 5 million bucks, you're going to have a really short meeting. No, I, I think that's great and true F um, and, and fantastic input from everyone. I mean, maybe this is a good opportunity with about 30% of the, of the room being first time entrepreneurs to also just sort of talk about stages uh, that, that companies will startups will go through and funding and who funds at what point in time and also kind of where each of you fits in. Again, I know you announced it earlier, but it's also a great sort of segue to that. Mary. Sure, Gary, I think are you 
Are you speaking? Well, you can go, Mary. Again, yeah, ladies first. <laughs> uh, no, I'm happy to happy to go in any order. But so I'll speak to the the early stage, which is where we invest, and maybe we can start at the very beginning, if you will. And so, you know, early stage investing is a very risky category, but to me, very the most meaningful and fun. Per personally, I really love it. At that point, you know, the things that we're prioritizing, we always say that we look for six things: team, 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 product, market traction. And that's just to show you that that we very heavily index on team. Everyone cares about team, of course, but particularly at early stage. And by early stage, we mean seed or pre-seed. So that's typically, you know, you have a live working MVP or minimal minimal viable product that's live and active. You may or may not be generating revenue. About half the companies we invest in are generating revenue when we invest, and that's typically in the 10 to 20K monthly recurring revenue stage. So just to give you a flavor of, of just how early, at that point, a company typically has raised some capital, not usually from institutions, friends and, a friends and family round or an angel round, just to prove the concept and, and really get that MVP out there and working. And so, you know, I would say at that point, it's pre-seed or seed stage. Our firm is comfortable being first check-in, first institutional check-in, we're happy to lead rounds or follow someone else's lead, but we're very much about collaborative capital and bringing others uh, to the table with us and co-investing in the syndicate. And so I'd say, you know, Nest Collaborative, the company I shared earlier, we were one of uh, about six firms who participated a lot of health tech expertise around the table with, you know, Altitude uh, Ventures, with Portfolios, Femtech Fund, with Wavemaker 360. It doesn't have to just be healthcare specific. I think it's important for you as an entrepreneur to think about who you want to have a seat at your table to be in the trenches with you for the next five to 10 years. And, you know, not just in the good times, but equally in the challenging times, who do you want to work with? Is that alignment there? So 100% encourage you to do the homework on the firm, on their investments, talk to entrepreneurs they've invested in. And it's easy sometimes when you're running a million miles an hour to want to take the first check, but really that alignment is so, so critical. So I couldn't, stress that strongly enough. And then, you know, traction, what does that mean? It means a lot of things depending on the business, but for companies this early, to us, revenue is secondary. There has to be, yes, a viable business model. And to F's point earlier, understanding that payer landscape to a T, understanding, you know, who's gonna pay for this? And that's a shifting landscape every day. Um, but more important is the engagement to us. So it's, you know, monthly active users or daily active users, depending on the business, how long do they spend? What's the, what's the churn rate? Why are people leaving when they do? Understanding the you know, CAC to LTV, just really understanding your data inside and outside. It's one of the most impressive and then the least impressive things we see is a founder doesn't know the data inside and out for their business. And then the last thing I would say is just, you know, don't shy away from the competitive landscape piece we know that these markets are, these spaces, there are numerous players. It doesn't mean that it's still not a billion dollar unicorn opportunity waiting. It's, it's um, imperative that you do your research, come prepared and articulate that. When we see a slide deck and someone says, we have no competition, you know, it generally shows us a lack of awareness or willingness to be transparent and open about how you fit into the, the broader context there. So encourage you to also look at companies who have raised you know, their series B, series C, who's gone public, what are they trading at, what's their multiple on revenue, if you can find the valuations for companies earlier in their life cycle, where were they relative to where you are, what does it take to get to, to each stage there, so a lot to unpack there, but it's, it's really exciting, I think that the framework applies to a lot of sectors, but in specifically, you know, within health tech, um, so yeah, team, 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 product market traction. So, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. Um... And I agree with virtually everything that Mary just said. You know, it's and and investing in healthcare. You know, having worn every possible operator hat there is over the last thirty-five years, including being a serial entrepreneur, I try to put myself in the seat of being the founder and the CEO too, which is a very different role than sitting in the seat of being a venture capitalist looking at a company. Um, and in healthcare, it's even more complex because depending on where your company is in the cycle, determines really what we're going to be looking at, right? So with our fund, 
we actually support everything from idea generation. We actually talk to and people who want to be innovators and we get together focus groups and identify problems and solutions and then help them create a company around that. But at the other end, we've made investments in, you know, series A investments as well, which are very different companies. So if you break that down, and so what are, what are we looking at when you are the founder coming to us, right? Now, if you're at the beginning of the cycle, you're a very early, early stage startup, as Mary mentioned, and, you know, we're not worried about revenue. You're pre-revenue at that point. Yes, we want to know that you have a solid business model that will ultimately, as Epp says, have an understanding of the process so you know where your revenue is going to come from, what your total addressable market is, who, who are the correct channel market partners to market your, your solution. Um, I can tell you that as a, as a venture capitalist, when we look at some of those early stage companies, what we try to do, believe it or not, is you, know, you don't think about this until you're actually on the investment side of it. When you make an investment, you have to say to yourself, okay, I'm a seven year fund, okay? And we're gonna get in really early. Where do I see this exit happening? Are they an early exit? Are they a late exit? Is it gonna take them seven years? We try to identify those device companies where we know, I mean, as the example, I mentioned Radiant, which is the fetal heart rate, the fetal uh, O2 SAP monitoring company. Sensafree, the company that's monitoring non-invasive blood pressures like an invasive arterial line with an EKG patch on the wrist. I mean, game-changing technologies um, where we know that our investment will never ever get to what we refer to as commercialization, right? You have an idea, you develop it into a company, and then it has to either exit somehow. So it's either going to go through commercialization and look for an acquirer or an IPO, or if it's such a radical idea that we know that the minute that this company gets FDA approved, which means you have to have a thorough understanding of what that involves, how much money it's going to take, and understand how you may have to pivot if, God forbid, somebody puts a pandemic in front of you. Um, you look at that and we can say, you know what, this company's never getting to that point because Philips or Edwards or McKesson are going to acquire this company the minute this technology is FDA approved. So, so from an from a investor perspective, we look at companies that way as well. And if you're a company that I know I'm going to have to walk you through commercialization, I know that my venture, my, that my network is going to be as important as my venture fund, because what you'll expect from us, and Mary alluded to this, money is just money at the end of the day, especially in healthcare. If you need a partner who can work with you as either a lead or as part of a syndicate, that can bring to you all those things necessary to push you through the ecosystem of introductions to healthcare systems, introductions to those channel partners that are not easy to penetrate in healthcare. It's not, it's very different than other sectors. So that becomes very important as well. So, and then the last part that I'll say is what I found fascinating is the evolution of where certainly the way we look at companies now, the one thing that is absolutely for sure that we haven't really discussed very much up until now is that what's radically changing in healthcare is data, okay? We are generating now so much data that is really not very effectively being used for many things, including improvement of healthcare, efficiency of healthcare, access to healthcare, not just domestically, but globally. All of those things are now possible because of data generation, but we have a huge void as to how to manage that data. And that's an opportunity for investments as well. And that's where blockchain comes in and data management comes in and machine learning comes in. All of those things become very, very relevant. And you can't just use the term as a way to pitch to a VC. You have to actually have an understanding of those and incorporate those into your solution. And of course, the last thing is I've talked about it and I laugh because nine years as an informaticist, when somebody says to me, oh yeah, we can integrate with electronic healthcare record. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand who you're talking to. Explain to me how you're going to actually accomplish that. Because I will tell you as a clinician that if you give me a solution and I have, I have five minutes with a patient, if I have to go outside of that electronic care, healthcare record, which is in front of one of the three computers that I have in front of me, 
and I have to go to another website, non-starter, never using your product, right? So unless, and that's a very early on part of development. And I don't have a problem as a venture capital fund saying to you, you know what, we can help you do that, but you need twice as much money as you think you need, because to get to that point, you need to adopt this kind of technology. So it's a, you know, I can't, I can't foster more how complex healthcare is. And you really, as a founder, have to really know your business model. You have to know your distribution chain and you have to know how your technology is going to be used in the hands of a clinician. Great, great feedback, everyone. You know, just to just to kind of follow on, I'm, I'll make this super simple, easy. We're a late stage, uh, late seed, and uh, Series A investor. You know, we typically invest similar to Mary in syndicate. Uh, you know, we've been very active in the category. Uh, you know, since the you know, as I mentioned, late 2000s, early teens. You know, so we've run a full cycle on digital health. So you know, you can probably hear us speaking from a lot of you know experience on the ground with some of this stuff. Um, you know, echo everything my colleagues say, uh, you know, just in terms of understanding where you're at, uh, you know, in terms of space, et cetera, et cetera. You know, to, to the point earlier, there are a lot of funds that have gotten into healthcare. I mean, there was a data point we saw recently uh, that, you know, 2x the volume of investors have got in. Uh, you know, our belief is if you're investing in healthcare today, you're about three years too late uh, to catch this little window right now. But you know, from our standpoint, there are so many great opportunities in such a great time as an entrepreneur to go do this. There are, you know, accelerators, incubators, et cetera, et cetera, that are all part of that early ecosystem. There are early funds like Mary's that can, you know, outside of the Valley here. So, you know, you're, you don't have to be at a, you know, Boston or Silicon Valley to make a, you know, make an impact, although it is helpful. And beyond that, you know, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can interact with the health systems themselves. You know, many of these hospitals and health systems have spun up their own accelerators and incubators, and you need to do that. The other thing, you know, just, you know, going back to some of the, the, the things that my colleagues were chatting about, about pitching us. Uh, the first thing, you know, we look at is regulatory. Uh, you know, if you don't understand it and you can't figure it out uh, and you don't have the right metrics and the right spends and everything else, you know, your, your DOA, to use a medical term with us, number one. Number two, your business, how you get paid, you know, that if you don't really understand that, you know, your DOA. The third, and this is the most important, is adoption cycle, right? You know, I've had a company that had every major brand name hospital, quote unquote, in contract with them. And it took them five years to get over five to 10K a month out of the largest spenders in the world with the best product, with everything else, just because it's really slow. So you have to understand what the, what the sales cycle and adoption curve is going to look like. If you don't get those three pieces in the onset, your DOA, then you move into some issues of, you know, making sure to Mary and, and, and Gary's point that, that you're really being honest, right? What is quote unquote traction? Talking to someone at a healthcare system is not traction. Even having a contract is not real traction. Even getting to 10, 20 K MRR is really testing in this business. This is alpha and beta testing. Traction in healthcare is hundreds of thousands, if not millions a month, right? And then to Gary's point, you know, most, if not all companies in this category will have an acquisition or will there then be on or ultimately an IPO track. You know, the problem with health tech is many companies end up with what we call zombie companies, uh, you know, lifestyle companies. They can get to 5, 10, 15 million in revenue, but that's their cap. That's their ceiling. And that's not helpful. And unfortunately, even though it's a great company for us as investors, you know, we can't participate in that and you will get dropped by us. So the real issue is understanding what's your exit. You know, the running joke is we don't write a check today without a good understanding of what the exit is. We probably have to have five or 10 potential acquirers in mind for a digital health company the day they walk, you know, we write a check, which means that you as a digital health company need to understand how you fit into the bucket. You know, coming in and saying Apple's going to buy you, you're DOA. You know, you've got to understand the supply chain, the distribution channel. If the word McKesson doesn't come out of your mouth somewhere along the line, 
you probably don't know your industry. If, if you haven't, like Gary said, talked about Epic in the first sentence or several deep in there, you're probably not going to get anywhere. So I really encourage you, you know, there are, uh, there's a lot of what we would call, you know, inexperienced capital moving into the play space. But like I said, 18 months from now, you'll be dropped DOA and you won't get the smart capital if you don't make these moves today. Um, I think that was a great, I'm sorry, Gary, go ahead. I was just going to ch chime in. I'm looking at the questions. So, you know, somebody did ask about the founding teams and is there a combination that works? Um, I think what's more important, and you know, I love what Mary said, you know, having, you know, I, I consider myself, I'll laugh about this, but I'm a doctor. I'm like a hacker when it comes to being a venture capitalist, but I'm surrounded by experts. Um, so for me, it's a learning process, right? But I, as an anesthesiologist, I very much believe in keeping, it's KSS, keep it simple, stupid, right? Because it's, you want to keep it simple to keep the patient alive at the end of the day, right? So when I look at companies, there are only three types of companies. There are companies that have great management teams and great ideas. And then there are companies that have great ideas with marginal management teams. And then of course, there's the third category, which I don't even wanna mention, right? So it, you have to be at least in the first two categories. And for us, because we have a network, when we look at a company and we look at a founding team, you may be in the marginal area, but that's fixable, okay? As long as you're open to learning and to leverage the help that's being given to you, right? So if we can, I, we have had so many companies that we've looked at, some of which we've invested in, because we looked at it and we were actually almost the mentor at the beginning, right? And we said, these are the things that you need to do to make this sustainable, clinically electronic healthcare record. If you're willing to do those and you're willing to understand that it's gonna take more money, we will take the risk because like Mary said, we love startups. We, lo we know what good ideas are. And that's probably as important as the management team, but a bad idea can't be fixed. Whereas a management team sometimes can. And if, you, if it's at least fixable, then it may be worth an investment. So that's important. And then with respect to the question, so what that means is the one thing that a management team has to have is it has to have channel expertise, right? You can't be a guy who, you know, and I've had it happen. Somebody who had a great exit as a technologist and decided I want to do something in healthcare and came up with an idea. Let's bring in Elizabeth Holmes, you know, and, and say, I've got a great solution for this, but I have no clue of the clinical side of it. And I've spent no time bringing on those people into my, onto my team. You know, I'll, we'll get pitches. We've all seen it. Mary F. I mean, you, you, I look at it as a clinician and they're, they're, they're a hundred percent clinical and there's not one physician on their management team. I mean, that's like insane. So that either says that it's such a crappy idea that they couldn't get a doctor in, in, interested or they didn't understand that they needed that clinical perspective. So when we're looking at teams, it just depends on what your solution is but you have to be open and you have to be able to think about that before you even get in front of us. Just a couple of quick thoughts on the last few minutes of conversation, you know, on the team front, you know, I, I agree. We, we index heavily on team in our minds. It very much depends on the business, but the idea itself can change. The product can change. The business model may change, but we over index on, is this the right team to, to back? And we prefer multi-founder teams not a hundred percent hard and fast requirement. We definitely prefer that, you know, when one person's feeling high, the other's feeling low, we can, we can lift each other up. And I grew up at Google. I grew up in Silicon Valley where at the time the vernacular was all about the technical founder, technical co-founder. That's no longer the case. I believe it depends on the specific business you're building, but you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, and the question to, to Gary's point is, is that channel, is that the sales business acumen there as well? So that's one quick point. The second is just a plus one on F's comments around accelerators. And one of my favorite uh, programs is here locally. It's the Techstars Accelerator with United Healthcare, right? And we've invested in what a company that came out of, of the program, River Health. But I just think that model of engaging with, with the corporations, getting the access to the mentorship, ultimately landing a commercial partnership, or just an understanding of that market. I, I would definitely, if you're early in the game, Take a look at that, but but more broadly, accelerators I think can be really helpful. Then I want to make a quick plug for overlooked markets in general. Again, remember that I'm a Silicon Valley kid. Absolutely love it there, and there's there's so much value. 
But when you come to a place, think about the business you're building and I'll make the plug for Minneapolis, right? One of the reasons that we are investing in health tech is we are home to Mayo Clinic, United Health Group, you know, Optum, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Alina. We've got relationships with all of those organizations and more. And it's those overlooked markets can often be the most capital efficient places to build business, businesses. And so as we emerge from COVID and go back to being in person, I would make a plug for, you know, consider where you want to start your company and what that market can provide to you. Well, thank you, panel, very much. We're about to pivot to the Q&A section. Um, but I do want to go back and just emphasize for the entrepreneurs in the room, you know, mark about the 40 minute mark into this recording, uh, because each one of the panelists share with you some of the really important things that they are looking for. So if you want to reach out and contact them, do your homework. Obviously, re rewatch what you just saw, uh, focus in on those, you know, figure out what they like, either doing your research on LinkedIn, on Crunchbase, figure out what people's, and this is not just the panelists, but also other VCs before you pitch them, figure out, you know, what kinds of deals they're like, what times the deal they're interested in, both in terms of the fund and the partners at the fund, um, and get educated. So if you heard some acronyms you didn't understand, figure out what those are. Uh, accelerators, incubators are a great place for, for you to kind of learn some of that, as well as other idea to IPO events. Plug for Rob and idea to IPO. Yeah, and yeah, certainly, Jason. And, and, you know, there's a lot of data out there. You know, follow us on Twitter. We post every 48 hours or less on digital health. I mean, what you can do is for the first time, get a look at what we're thinking about and, you know, understand where our, my, our head is, so to speak, in regard to the digital health category. And that is something that, you know, has never been able to happen out there. So I, you know, I know, uh, it, you know, for example, some of the folks at other VCs as well. So it, we are just very simple advanced ventures on Twitter. It's also a way to get in touch with us through, through a direct message, as well as LinkedIn as well. We post on both of those. So follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Twitter. You'll see what we're thinking. And that can really guide your thought processes of an entrepreneur. If you can kind of climb into our head and live there rent free while we're busy doing this every day. Well, that's great. Uh, so that's one way to follow along advanced ventures, see what they're doing. Uh, Gary and Mary, if you'd again, sort of share your contact info or how you want to be followed, that'd be great. And then we'll ask, we'll get to some of the questions for about 20 minutes or so. So we can let everyone leave in time to go to their board meetings and, you know, take their next, next pitch. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm, uh, we're just, we're bread and butter ventures.com. One thing we love, every member of our team does open office hours every week. You can book them online, virtual, anyone in the world. You can pitch us a company, ask for advice. We've helped kids help navigate their college decisions before. So we're totally open. <laughs> we, uh, sure. we love it. We're at, at Fred Butter VC. I'm at Mary Grove. I'm really active on Twitter as well. I'd love to connect with you. Yeah, and this is Gary. So um, what I'll say for us is, you know, we have the venture fund and that, you know, you can reach me at Gary at globalhealthimpactfund.com. But we also have the network. And when we do due diligence or, or work with startups on the network side, um, I like to say that what we're working on doing from the clinician perspective is almost like the good housekeeping seal of approval. Um, when we look at companies from a due diligence perspective, even if we don't make the investment, we love to take companies and put them in our network, give them a community there and interact with our ecosystem and then work with other venture capitalists like Mary, you know, like F other VCs because most of the investments end up being syndicated investments anyway. Um, so that it's important for us to all be collaborating, but we also can work with your company to kind of get you to the point where if you're very early stage on to be able to maximize your presentation, maximize your, um, your pitch deck in your room and all of that. So, you know, you can reach out to us for that as well. And that's Gary at global health impact network.net. So Gary, we, we got a question for you, which, uh, earlier in the program, you mentioned, uh, Healthcare moving from ep episodic to being uh, to be more continuing care uh, that involves telehealth. What are you seeing, or have you seen anything uh, in terms of that development? And how fast do you think that change is going to happen now that we've just had a whole bunch of gasoline uh, poured on the telehealth uh, fire, if you will? Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a very important point because you know one of the things as we've talked about is that the pandemic has actually 
enabled us to see the gaps in our healthcare system and to show that we have been a disease focused Western type of medicine approach. You get sick, we treat you, we make you better, see you later. <laughs> You know, and then there's the beginning side of it. So the front end or the first mile is the preventive aspect of it, which is not necessarily medicine, but it's physical, you know, your physical condition, your nutrition, all of those like before disease concepts that we should help with. And we have technology now. We have ways with blockchain and tokenization to reward people for the appropriate right behavior. We can also do that with, on the insurance side. If you do take care of yourself, you're more likely to get coverage or get better coverage than if you don't take care of yourself. And that's a little bit of a controversial subject, but it's out there. And then on the back end of it, if you do have chronic disease, how are we managing you day to day, month to month, year to year at your point of care? How are we helping you to take care of your chronic disease with remote patient monitoring and IOT and ability to have access to telemedicine so you don't have to go to a, 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 an office or send somebody to you, as we talked about in that hybrid model. So it becomes very important. What we're doing on our network side is, believe it or not, again, as a clinician, clinician network, we're also creating a patient network. And we're connecting the clinician and patient network with a kind of a telemedicine solution uh, through our network, which addresses that continuous care as opposed to episodic. So you have access to information, scientific evidence-based information about disease states, but you also have access on how to manage your personal health from a genomics perspective, from a precision medicine perspective. And on the other side of it, if you are close to end of life, the palliative perspective, it all has to be a continuum of care. And right now it's very disjointed. It's we, we practice in silos, we deliver care in silos. And I believe, I truly believe that because of the acceleration of technology and now the focus that we have because of the pandemic that we're about to hockey stick um, in terms of the way we deliver care. And what's exciting to me as a clinician is the solutions that we're building are deployable worldwide. We're not talking about just Contra Costa or Minnesota. We're talking about Bangladesh and we're talking about places that don't have access to care and we can deliver excellent care to the point of care anywhere in the world. And that's the part that's exciting. And there's a lot of attention from the VC perspective, from the HCO perspective of the government perspective, now that we have the, the, the correct administration to, to kind of deal with that. Um, so I'm very enthusiastic and excited about how we're accelerating that model right now. F, do you, there's a, that almost kind of dovetails perfectly with another question that's tailored for you, F. <clears throat> uh, I mean, do you see that continued acceleration or do you think that there's gonna be a, a bit of a pullback as we continue to move forward in time and, and that digital health will kind of recede as it was sort of before the pandemic in terms of funding? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's really challenging to, to, to estimate that model. You know, there's a ton of capital coming in. You know, we were joking before we went live today about I remember the AR VR bubble, you know, our, you know, the first, second and now third blockchain, you know, crypto bubble. Uh, you know, I, I think these things are, are hard to read. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see the backlog in the space is what is most interesting. And when I say backlog, what that means is therapeutics. Uh, you know, there is tremendous, amazing technology that is jammed in phase one to three clinicals. I mean, we're even seeing stage four clinical companies that should have billion dollar market caps that are scraping around for capital right now, you know, on therapeutics that are game changing in, in, in key disease states like cancer that are really that are really in the backlog of the pipeline. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, where you fit into the cycle as a startup, where you're going to start your journey, where you're going to end, um, you know, in terms of you know, some of the elements that, that, that Gary was was bringing up, and certainly Mary is the kindest person in the world in venture and going to make us all look bad to a degree, um, you know, but 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 the, the short version is that, you know, you really have to be thoughtful about what is out there. And, you know, being able to walk into our office to find out that, you know, 
oh, we've got a, you know, IoT COVID sensor and figure out that, you know what, Apple watches have just figured out using their heart rate monitoring that they can probably do a better job than you and you've already got it on, you know, a zillion wrists out there. Those are really big things that you have to be aware of. So, you know, now is the greatest time, but you also have to be discerning there. Is that a good answer? I think it's accurate, yeah. I think it's great. Uh, so Mary, a question for you. Uh, as digital health tech becomes more focused or niche uh, in target markets, how do you weigh the ability of startups to extend into adjacent opportunities? Do, do you, is that something you look at? It's a great question. You know, I think when building building a startup, the question to ask yourself is what, what type of business am I building and therefore, or what are my goals? And then what's the best form of capitalization for that business? And the, the answer is, not every business is or should be venture backable or on that venture track. And so that's the question that we always work with companies at the early stage. If you're going the VC path and want to raise traditional venture capital, know that you know as long as the intentions and expectations are aligned, VCs are investing for financial return, for an expected exit event. You know, in general, we are longer term investors, expect to hold an investment for plus or minus seven years, but not not two years and not 15 years. And so you know, companies who are have a different model or want to pass it on as a family business for multi generations. That's not the right venture. Isn't the right solution for you. So, um, with that in mind, you know, what kind of multiples are we hoping for for venture style returns? Different funds have different formulas, but in general, you're investing in companies you think can be billion dollar businesses, right? And that's the whole the moonshot. In general, a firm will assemble a portfolio of X number whether it's a dozen or 50 companies. And the general model is that, you know, roughly three or so companies will return your entire fund, hopefully multiple times over. And so every VC is looking at it through the lens of, could this return my fund? Or how does this investment go to zero? Less interested in the, this company's going to flip for a 2X return in two years. That's a great angel investment. Find angel, angel investors. I would love to return cash on cash in two years. So figure out, you know, what are you building? What are you going for? And that gets to the question of if the market is super niche that you're going after, is the technology that you're building sort of um, almost sector agnostic, if you will, as far as the, who the audience is, could it roll out into other forms of, of care, other demographics, other populations pretty easily? Do you need to be building your system in a modular way such that you, if you're going to one state first, can you just hit go on additional states once you clear regulatory approvals. So think about it from that perspective. But yes, if you're building a hyper-focused, you know, that the, the acronym TAM, right? What's your total addressable market? That number has to be pretty big if you want to go after a traditional venture capital. That was a great transparent answer. I, I love it. <laughs> I don't have any comment on top of that. Um, uh, so maybe if we kind of move into some of the more nuts and bolts uh, questions in terms of, uh, I guess, how in terms of COVID and ca access to capital across markets, because we've got folks from all over the world. Um, do each of you play only in the United States at this point in time? Are you looking at deals outside of the U US? I mean, and if you are looking at deals outside of the US, how, how, like what, what lens does your lens change at all? What you look at and, and what makes a good, good potential investment for you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to chime in. So for fund one, which is about to close for us, um, we have made some outside investments, not a lot, but we, one of our companies is in Israel. Okay, that's actually that blood pressure company, Sensa Free that I mentioned. Um, and that deal was with Samsung, Samsung and TransLink, two very big venture capitalists. Um, Fun too, we actually, you know, the reason we chose first time around to really not deal with international was more of just the complexity of making those kind of investments and raising that kind of money. It just, you know, from a legal perspective, it's much more complicated. So for fund two, which we're doing three times the size of our first fund with the same model, we're now taking international investors and we're looking at international investments. You know, for what I mentioned earlier, you know, especially since we're pretty focused on digital health, a lot of the solutions that we're looking at have certainly uh, global implications, you know, and, and, and on top of it, you know, 
I mean, at the end of the day, uh, even with 510k status, the FDA is the FDA and getting something approved in the United States is not a simple process. Many of our companies are actually, even the EU has become more complicated, but they're, they're looking for, to, to get approval for their solutions in the EU. But we've actually adopted an interesting model when you look at the global perspective of it to take advantage of it is that, so we have uh, two of our partners, newer partners. One is a, a gentleman, Alex Kahana, who is an expert on blockchain healthcare globally, has lectured at the UN, just got back from East Africa. And he met with entrepreneurs, met with the, the, the Minister of Health. And there are third world countries that are that do have money and they do are interested in leveraging digital health for obvious reasons, deploy care in places where they don't even have access. The East, you know, the East African you know, system, their entire financial subsidy system is based on, on, on smartphones. So it's a perfect environment to, to leverage for healthcare. So the idea of going out to these foreign governments and foreign locations, which are clamoring for digital health solutions, we're looking at a model where when we look to invest in a company and they're not in those environments, it may be easier for them to take their model and beta test it in, an, in a market like East Africa, where there are less hurdles right from a regulatory perspective, prove it clinically, the equivalent of would be, you know, a phase three trial, and then come back while you're still in the process of doing FDA to use that as part of your marketing that we've proven this at seven hospitals and a million users in this environment and it works. You know, whether it's an African patient or whether it's a US patient or whether it's a Brazilian patient, it doesn't make a difference and it's the same for the doctors. So, um, so that becomes more of a global model that we're trying to evolve to that we originally did not have a focus on. Great, yeah, I, you know, we, we've historically had uh, partners outside of the US uh, for digital health. We believe, you know, some of the things Gary said are certainly interesting if you want to drive, drive clinical trials offshore in a pre preemptive sort of way. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the regulatory framework is very dependent on countries. So, you know, if you're going to sell, you know, uh, you know, in North America, you know, it's the FDA. So, you, have, you know, you, you know, being an outside of the, you know, uh, the U.S. as a startup, trying to do business in the U.S., get through an FDA trial, you know, it, it's just really, really hard, number one. Number two, uh, you know, if you're going to try and do it in the EU, uh, you know, the regulatory environment in the EU in 2022 is going to change. They're totally upending their entire sort of regulatory process. So anybody gets a approval or starts any kind of a process before 2022, unless you've taken that in consideration, is very challenging. I mean, and I think, I, you know, I'll take a page from a lot of the other, you know, sectors we invest in, uh, you know, sadly, you know, the global market is meaningful in, in, in really, you know, a few places. And, you know, the spend, uh, you know, it, it, to go beyond uh, an English speaking North American market is very, very challenging for a startup. Startups to come to us and say, we're going to go do business in Europe, uh, you know, do, they don't get a lot of traction, in, you know, in our mind. So, you know, if you've got a big opportunity, sadly, this is the big place to get it. And then to the second point, you know, there's a lot of healthcare companies, you know, as Mary was saying, that, you know, don't need to be IPOs. They don't need to be anything else. You can build a great business without coming to venture. There's also a ton of government money all the way down to the, the city and state levels that are available for these th kinds of things. You know, building a telehealth health platform that goes public or gets bought you know, that's really hard. Building a telehealth platform that ends up being a good 10, 15, 20 million dollar business that solves real user needs in your region, in your city, in your state. Those are great things as well. You know, just understand, you know, we work for people, our investors, and their expectations are quite high and we have to follow their lead. Well, wonderful. Well, we are, we're coming down uh, in terms of the amount of time left in today's program. So what I'd like to do is give an open mic to each of the panelists for about 60 seconds or so to provide any information, any thoughts, any comments, uh, also to provide your contact information one more time if you want to be contacted by anyone here. Um, 
So uh, we'll start, since you let us off today, Mary, we'll start with you if that's okay. Sure, I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity. What a rich, uh, incredibly interesting discussion. I feel like both of you guys need to have your own network TV show or something. Uh, but would love to continue, you know, working with with both of you and with everyone who joined us today. I would say overall, you know, the future is is bright. I'm bullish. I think that we've emerged. Well, we're beginning to emerge from a difficult era, but we have seen historically that periods of economic recession have led to incredible unicorns. Whether it's WhatsApp, Instagram, Uber, locally here in Minneapolis, you know, companies like NativeX, uh, Gov Delivery, who've who've had successful exits. So I think we're the silver lining is constraint breeds creativity. And I think we're in a really great position to do so. So would love to um, stay connected. And, and to answer the earlier question, we at Bread and Butter Ventures, we can invest outside the US. We primarily focus on on United States. Where it's outside tends to be a function of a specific sector. So food tech, for example, is one of our active practice areas. We see a tremendous amount of food tech from, from Israel, from Brazil, from, uh, you know, Asia, we've seen a lot of great inbound. So it's more situationally dependent on that. But if you are thinking of coming to the US, you know, my advice would be most generalist firms, unless they're large global firms, are gonna, you need to come to the US, you know, open in a presence here, establish a customer base here. Most VCs here want to invest in Delaware C Corp. So, you know, think about those considerations, but it is a very global world. And I'm confident that the best solutions, you know, the best ideas can come from, from anywhere. And so, Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this, this great conversation. Thank you, Gar Gary. Thanks, thanks, Mary, that was great. Um, so yeah, that, first of all, it's been a pleasure, you know, interfacing with, with you know, in, interfacing with all, all of you on this call. It's been a great call. There's a lot of great feedback from the audience. Um, what I would say is that I would encourage any of the entrepreneurs out there, we have a large group of entrepreneurs who are really um, very interested, you know, no matter what stage you are, um, and, and if you're in a, in a digital health environment, I would encourage you to reach out to our network, join our network, leverage it, take advantage of it. Um, and then, you know, as I said, we're pretty agnostic and we, you know, we will foster the relationships between other organizations and other venture capitalists as well. And I encourage you to, you know, to, to contact us, Gary at globalhealthimpactnetwork.net. Well, first, let me start off by thanking uh, our, our fearless leader here, Jason, our moderator. Thank you so much for, for you know, wrangling such amazing people here. My colleagues, Mary, Gary, great. Hope we're on a ton of panels in, going forward. Love to connect Mary offline as well. I think, uh, you know, I love Minnesota. Uh, it's a great place and uh, lots of good reasons to be there and find great entrepreneurs. Uh, Rob, congratulations. This going global is huge. Uh, you know, you should have been global the whole time and the pandemic made you do it. I really appreciate it and so glad I'm not eating Costco pizza after this. And then, you know, just in closing here, you know, I, I will say that, you know, entrepreneurs around the world, this is a great time, regardless what category you're in. Uh, digital health is, is a phenomenal category. Stay at it. There are lots of ways for you to transition into the United States if that's where you want to be or build great big companies in your own country. So, you know, it's one of the greatest times to be alive. Uh, it's one of the greatest times to, to be an entrepreneur. The, you know, the funding is out there, the accelerators, the incubators, and their VCs like us will, we, you know, will help you map it. When I started as an entrepreneur, you know, this was like Wizard of Oz. We had no idea how to go and tap folks like us. Now you can sign up and actually talk to a super successful technologist in VC like Mary by just signing up. So, you know, blow up our inbox, get a lot of great data and build awesome companies because that makes our job work. Well, well, terrific. Uh, and we're about out of time today. I want to thank each of our panelists, Mary Grove, Gary Goldman, Ephraim Lindenbaum. Uh, I want to thank each of the attendees today. We had a lot of questions. We were able to answer a handful of them. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them. My name is Jason Putnam Gordon. I'm a venture capital and emerging growth company attorney. If you want to reach me, uh, LinkedIn or Jay Gordon at Pulsinelli. I also have office hours, so feel free to reach out. Happy to chat with you. Uh, I want to thank Idea to IPO. It was a fantastic event today, and the recording will be made available in about a week. So, other than that, thank you again, everyone. Have a safe and uh, Happy, healthy day. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Well. Bye -bye now. Good, Good luck. Bye.